Absolutely. First, let me say thanks to everybody for coming out. Thanks to the Texas Book Festival for having me here. And my apologies for starting just a couple of minutes late, but that's what happens when you try to bring your luggage into the Capitol building. <laughs> So I want to tell a story, and I'm glad that I got a laugh there, because I want to tell a story that is not funny at all, um, a story that is really at the heart of my book that stays with me all the time when I do this work, because I'm a law professor, and this is a story of a law student. And I just need to give you a little bit of background before I read this story, which is called Dying for Knowledge. This story takes place in Algeria, so in my father's home country, back in the 1990s, in what Algerians call the Dark Decade. And this was a decade of violence between jihadist groups that were the sort of so-called Islamic State of that time in North Africa, and the Algerian government that was backed by the military. And we don't know the exact figures, but somewhere between 100,000 and 200,000 people were killed, primarily by the armed groups, though there were also gross abuses committed by the state. Uh, and this happened in relative obscurity. The international community did not pay much attention. This was the pre-9-11 world, and I think globally we had not woken up to the dangers yet uh, posed by jihadist movements. So it's in that context that I would like to share this particular particular story. Emel Zanun Zawani's watch stopped at 517. That is the moment that she fell in the street on January 26, 1997, an instant after a member of the armed Islamic group cut her throat on the outskirts of Sidi Musa. In November 2012, when I am finally able to locate them in a quartier populaire east of Algiers, I spend several hours talking with ML's mother, Horia, and her surviving daughters. Sitting on the couch in front of her TV, Khalti Horia, or Auntie Horia, as everyone calls her, wears a long blue dress and glasses that hang around her neck. Both stalwart and shattered, she shows me ML's watch, which was returned to her by the police. Its white face features small green flower buds just under the spot where the glass is broken. The second hand still aims optimistically upward, frozen 57 seconds after 517, and approaching a 518 that will not come. 22 years old and a third year law student at the University of Algiers, ML lived in the dorm. She wanted to visit her family on that 17th day of Ramadan, a day known as Ghazwat Badr, in commemoration of an historic Muslim victory. So she boarded the bus for Sidi Musa, her hometown, and would never finish law school. ML's mother tells me everything she had heard about what happened on the bus. Just outside the town, the vehicle was stopped at a faux barrage, a fake checkpoint. ML occupied a seat behind the driver, who was a neighbor of hers, and held her school bag. Though she did not cover her head in Algiers, she had a friend's shawl wrapped around her hair when the men from the armed Islamic group climbed aboard. One came to Amel, hit her on the shoulder, and said, Ahl al hukuma partisan of the government, get up, someone kill her. They grabbed the law student by the arm, and still she dared to say, don't touch me. According to Khalti Huria, Amel then turned and looked at everyone. Even now, the mother appeals to her daughter's fellow passengers as she weeps and tells me the story. ML did not speak, but she begged you with her eyes and asked you to save her, but no one could. When they got out of the bus, one armed man had a knife and was rubbing it on the pavement, preparing to kill her. There are two versions of what happened next. Some said ML was kicked as she was getting out of the bus and fell to the ground. Others remember that she had her throat cut while she was still standing. Her death was an atrocity. It was also meant as a warning. In the moment after ML's watch stopped, the GIA men told all the other passengers, if you go to school, if you go to the university, the day will come when we will kill all of you just like this. The terrorists had posted placards all over Sidi Musa saying that young people must stop studying and stay home. 
As a law professor, I so want to understand why a young woman with her whole life ahead of her would continue her legal education when she could and would be murdered as a result. Apparently, Emil had said to her father, I will study law and you will always have your head held high. I am a girl and you will always be proud of me. I will do the work of a man. Mrs. Zanun herself, a housewife, had long dreamed of her children studying, and all six of them did. Emil's sister Emina explains, our mother inculcated in us the idea that studying means you are a free woman. Mom said, I am ready to lose all four of them. I will sacrifice them for knowledge. When people remember Emel Zanun, who was assassinated by the terrorists, Emina says, they say she was the girl who was killed for studying law. People say she was an example for us. While still cherishing the values that Emel died for, her death was also an agony for her family. And so was the way they found out about it. Sidi Musa was then a wasteland of terror. That was their hometown outside of Algiers. It had no running water at the time. It had no electricity after the terrorists had attacked the local power station and no telephone service. So the family was never sure when to expect Emel or their other daughters home. Finally, 20 policemen showed up at the door, but faced with the mother and her younger children, the policemen found themselves completely unable to deliver the news that they had come to give. One asked Khalti Horia how many daughters she had who studied in Algiers, then told her enigmatically that she and her husband had been convoked to meet the prosecutor the next day. Their work undone, the cops drove off and left the family wandering in the, wondering in the dark. Khalti Horia had a bad feeling. Any of her college student daughters, or all three of them, could have been headed home that night. When the police left, a group of neighbors came to the apartment, including the bus driver's wife. Everyone assumed that the family now knew the news. Khalti Huria begged the driver's wife, Fatiha, tell me. So the driver's wife shared as much as she could. They cut your daughter's throat. This answer only left terrible questions. Khalti Huria said, which one? One neighbor said, the one who wore glasses. No one seemed to know the precise facts. With no one able to give her a definite answer and no working telephone, Khalti Huria ignored the evening curfew and took off with her young son, running through the perilous streets of Sidi Musa until she got to the gendarmerie, the police station. When she finally found herself face to face with the gendarme, Khalti Huria remembers that she said, my son, tell me, how many of my daughters? He said, Madame, only one, the one who was at law school. She was wearing jeans and a coat. The bereaved mother insisted, swear to me, he swore. So in the most awful moment of her life, Khalti Horia actually even felt gratitude. She said, I prayed and I sat and I kissed the earth and I said, God give me strength. They were all three at the university. It was a little less painful that it was one rather than two or rather than three. Even as she found out she had not lost all three daughters, the reality that one was gone, and how, sank in. But Khalti Huria's agony in that moment gave way to rage. She told me I sat on the ground and I said everything that came into my mind. That was the hour my struggle began. Her daughter Emina describes the mother's long walk home through the desolation of Sidi Musa. The commissariat was far from where we lived, she said. All along the road, Mama insulted the terrorists. She didn't stop. The police said if we had 10 mothers who had lost their child who did what Madame Zanun did, the terrorists could never have won anything in Sidi Musa. There are many who died before Emel. No one had done what Mom did. It was enormous to make that journey, not to have fear. For her, it might have been in her head. Who cares anymore? In the dark streets of the martyred town, Mrs. Zanun taunted those who had taken her child. You killed Emel, now come and kill me. After her Jeremiah, the gendarme came to the house and told her husband and the rest of the family that they all had to leave Sidi Musa immediately. So they buried Emel and they left their lives behind them. 
One of ML's younger sisters, Lamia, later overcame her own despair and went to law school in ML's memory, practicing today in Algiers as her older sister hoped to, something that is only possible because armed fundamentalism was largely, though not completely, defeated in Algeria. Fundamentalism will not win, even if they say, Allahu Akbar, God is great, all day long, Khalti Huria tells me. Lamia, the other sister, the lawyer's sister, takes me into the small, neat living room to see Amel's framed portrait, which hangs on the wall. The law student had pitch black hair that fell just below her shoulders and luminous dark eyes that are now the centerpiece of this room. She was not smiling when the picture was taken, but her determined expression displays what a classmate of hers had told me of her that she had both the eloquence and the lively personality needed to be a successful lawyer. She had a big future in front of her, her classmate recollected. Somehow, in the portrait on the living room wall, ML looks both serene and entirely aware of what her future might hold. Apparently, she had said to her mother a few weeks before her murder, Mom, put this in your head. Nothing will happen to us, inshallah. God willing. But if something happens, you and dad, you must know that we are dead for knowledge. You and father must keep your heads held high. ML's watch stopped at 517, but she lives on in Algeria and everywhere else that women and men continue to fight fundamentalism like she did by striving for knowledge and by keeping their heads held high. Something that I really loved about your book is that you're able to balance so eloquently very traumatic, difficult stories to read with, with hope and with uh, encouragement for people to continue to do good in the world. I want to hear a bit about your uh, reporting on the youth theater program in Pakistan, in Lahore. Uh, the Rafi Peer Theater Workshop. Can you tell us a bit about that and um, what what lessons? Well, why why practicing theater is a form of resistance? Thanks. That's a great question. Let me start with the hope part. I agree with you that hope is absolutely critical in this story. And in fact, ML's name means hope in Arabic. And so hope is really a theme throughout the book. I found myself looking for her hope. She somehow managed to maintain uh, hope. And one of the places that I found ML's hope was in the wonderful Rafi Peer Theater Workshop that you mentioned in Lahore, Pakistan. And this is a wonderful cultural arts organization that for decades has both promoted Pakistani performing artists, but also has brought performing artists from around the world to play across Pakistan. Uh, and Rafi Peer was a famous playwright, so it, the company was named by his sons and daughters who run it after him. Uh, and in about 2008, they started to receive death threats with the rise of jihadist groups, uh, threats that condemned them, that said that what they were doing with music and dance was un-Islamic. And I had the great privilege of meeting Faizan Pirzada, who was one of the siblings who ran the company. And he absolutely rejected this characterization of their work. He's quite a religious person himself. Uh, in a very spiritual, mystical way. And for him, song and dance was a part of worship. And so they absolutely refused to give in. They continued with their performances. But unfortunately, the jihadists refused to give up as well. And so in 2008, their eighth World Performing Arts Festival in Lahore was actually struck by a bomber with three explosive devices uh, that injured nine people, which was very serious, but luckily no, no one was killed. But they had to evacuate the entire premises. And the Pirzadas then faced this really difficult question, and in a way this relates back to the theme of optimism, which is, do you go ahead the next day with the festival? Right? Do you decide that freedom of expression and the arts are so important that notwithstanding the threat, uh, you will go forward, 
or do you decide that the safety of your audience is so important, so primary, and you just can't take that responsibility? And after a long debate at about 1 o'clock in the morning, the family decided, uh, literally, the, the show must go on. Or as Faizan said to me, ladies and gentlemen, this ain't going to work. This festival is going to go ahead. There is nothing against Islam in this. So they announced that they would go on the next day, as planned, but they had no idea if anyone would come. I mean, think about it. When you made the decision to come here today, if you had to wonder whether there was a possibility of a bombing at this event, you know, wouldn't that have radically changed the calculus? Especially those of you I see around with kids, and the Pirzadas had lots of children who came to their events. Uh, and Faizan thought they had to go ahead anyway. He said, well, if we bow down to the Islamists, we'll just be sitting in a dark corner and there will be nothing. They didn't know what would happen. And in fact, thousands and thousands of people came out that next day, more people than they had had at their events before. And they were delighted and completely terrified, as you can imagine. And Faizan told me he ran up to a woman who had come into the venue with two small children. And he said, you do know that there was a bombing here yesterday. And you do know that there is a threat of more bombs today. And she said, I know that. But I used to come to your festival with my mother, and I still have those images in my mind. And I want the festival to go on, and we have to be here. So with those kind of amazing audiences who had that kind of optimism and that kind of commitment to the arts, they were able to finish that festival on schedule. And then, of course, they lost all of their sponsors the following year because the sponsors were so afraid of the security threat. So when I met them in 2010, they were actually in the middle of the first subsequent event that they were able to have in the same venue where the bomb had gone off in 2008. And that was the ninth Youth Performing Arts Festival uh, in Lahore. And it was an environment when the Pakistani Taliban had begun their systematic targeting of girls' schools that would later culminate in the attack on the heroic Malala Yousafzai. And you can ask, in that sort of an environment, having been through a bombing, you know, did the Pirzadas sort of try to be careful? Did they shy away from the danger? In fact, what they decided to do was to stage girls' school theater. So when I arrived, I had the great honor of seeing Nang Wal, which was a musical in the Punjabi language performed by the girls of Lahore Grammar School. And you could just feel everyone holding their breaths collectively to sort of see if we would get to the end of this wonderful, wonderful show. And when we did, there was this kind of group exhale and this burst of applause. And I remember standing there in the middle of that ovation with the sort of weeping uh, mothers and, and proud fathers and thinking that, you know, the bombers made headlines here two years ago for their pessimism, for their violence. But this night full of hope and optimism is absolutely as important of a story. But unfortunately, it's a story that is much less likely to be told. Well, I'm so glad that you are telling it. And I wonder what you think the most important lessons from your book should be for an American audience in particular. Um, why is it? Why is it important to know these stories, and, and, and what should we do about, about these issues that you're bringing up? That's another great question. I've thought about that a lot, how to boil this down into sort of the takeaway, uh, and particularly the takeaway in this context in the U.S. I think, you know, the critical message is that everywhere you hear about radical jihadists and Muslim fundamentalist movements, there are also people in those contexts, women's rights defenders, journalists, artists, ordinary people who are organizing against those movements, who are defying those movements, who are sometimes risking or even losing their lives to stand up to those movements. And we don't hear about those people. 
And that has to change. If we actually want to see a successful process of defeating these movements globally, which I think is critical for human rights, we need to listen to the people on the front lines who have the most experience uh, with dealing with these movements and who have a very sophisticated analysis that doesn't often get translated into English. Those are not the people invited to talk onto CNN. And I think we absolutely have an interest and indeed a responsibility to listen to those people. So for me, that's really, that is first and foremost the key takeaway. Um, we will have time for a few questions, so if people are interested in lining up uh, in, the center, in the center aisle, um, if you have questions. I wanted to ask you about ISIS as well. Um, they've really come to power after you wrote this book, but I know that that's going to be on a lot of people's minds, and um, I wonder if you could talk a bit about what the appropriate strategy for the U.S. to deal with that would be, um, if, if force is a useful or appropriate answer to the tragedies that we're, that we're seeing in, in Syria and, and Iraq now. So what is interesting, if you look back at the media coverage, including the New York Times that I know you used to write for, um, the ISIS story, the, the reality of ISIS on the ground has been around for much longer than the media coverage. When it was just local people uh, in Iraq, in Syria, uh, Kurds very often, who were standing up to these movements, who were sometimes dying in droves, the world was not paying attention, and I think that that is a terrible shame. Uh, I'm glad that the world is now paying attention. Uh, but, you know, now because we have waited, I think it will be even more difficult to really take on these movements. I think it's so important not just to think of ISIS as a security threat, which clearly it is, especially in the region, but also globally, but to think of it as a threat to human rights to think about the struggle against ISIS as a human rights struggle. And again, to remember the Syrians and the Iraqis, including Kurds in both contexts, who have been leading that charge against these movements. And I, you know, again, I wonder, why are we not hearing about them? So I think about Samira El Naimi, very brave Iraqi woman lawyer, who was killed in Mosul in late September after speaking out very publicly, denouncing ISIS in particular for its destruction of historical sites in her hometown. And I keep wondering why we never see her picture on television along with the pictures of the horribly murdered journalists. And I'm glad we see their uh, photos, but we should see hers too and uh, the pictures of so many Iraqis who have stood up to these movements. Uh, I wish I could have gone to Iraq for my book, but for logistical reasons I wasn't able to. Although I was very lucky, I was able to interview a wonderful uh, Iraqi women's rights defender uh, named Yanar Mohammed, who heads an organization called the Organization of Women's Freedom in Iraq. And this remarkable organization today is not only speaking out against ISIS's atrocities against women, including the practice of sexual slavery, including what appears to be very widespread use of uh, rape, uh, forcing women to dress in certain ways and uh, using corporal punishments when women uh, do not. So they are denouncing those ab abuses, Elfie is. But they also are running a shelter on the ground in Iraq for women fleeing from that violence. And they even have a helpline, a telephone number, that women can call who are in need of assistance. Think about how courageous it is to do that work. So I think one of the key challenges is to find out how best to support those organizations, those individuals on the ground uh, who are really taking this issue on. You can go to the website, OWFI uh, is the acronym for the organization, and find out ways to support them. I do think that force is an appropriate response in certain circumstances to armed groups that systematically target civilians because it may be the only way uh, to protect those civilians. And I do believe that this is one of those cases. But as a professor of international law, I would also say that that force always has to be used in accordance with international law, uh, both the UN Charter and the laws of war, the Geneva Conventions and their additional protocols. Now, as I mentioned earlier, you know, the, the left doesn't like part of the first part, 
of what I said, that sometimes force is necessary, and the right sometimes doesn't like the second part, that the rules still apply. Uh, but for me, that is the complicated reality. But force can only be a part of the solution, right? Force is a very blunt instrument, and it has to be a part of a much broader approach that includes uh, support for human rights defenders in the region, that includes massive economic reconstruction, that includes support for humanist education, which everywhere I went, people told me was the most important long-term solution to the problem. I see we have a question. Yeah, at the present moment, in Le Libya in the past, and Afghanistan in the distant past, distant in relative terms. So uh, why aren't you talking out against that? And isn't that the first thing to do, as well as to uh, reduce our blind and unconditional support for the Saudi Wahhabist uh, propagandists, et cetera, who are also underwriting the jihadist movement? Well, I don't have that as my key takeaway because the U.S. is not always the center of everything. Everything is not always about us. People have their own regional dynamics. Now, that said, I do address the sometimes very negative role that U.S. foreign policy has played in the region, including some of the things that you alluded to, uh, support in the past for the Mujahideen groups and the most extreme of the Mujahideen groups in Afghanistan in the war against the Soviet Union that really helped the problem metastasize because young people, including from Algeria, came and fought there and got training that was supported by the U.S. and the Saudis and so on uh, and went home. Home. Uh, certainly in the Iraqi context, uh, there is no question, and I say this in the book, uh, that what I believe was an illegal U.S. war in Iraq in 2003 uh, clearly created the situation in which the ISIS problem is now unfolding. Uh, and the U.S. was very clearly warned by this, including about allies in the past, Hosni Mubarak, with whom I didn't agree about a lot of things, but I agreed with him about this. He said, uh, you know, if you overthrow Saddam Hussein, you will create a thousand Osama bin Ladens, and that is basically uh, what happened. Uh, there are both endogenous and exogenous causes of Muslim fundamentalism and jihadism. My father was an anthropologist and he always explained that to me and I finally understood that that meant internal and external. And I think we have to look at all of those causes and all of those layers of responsibility. I worry sometimes now in the Middle East, in North Africa, where I travel a lot, that people use the idea that this is all coming from the West as a kind of conspiracy theory that alleviates the responsibility of having to talk about some of the causes closer to home, like the way religious education has been carried out. But you're absolutely right that for Americans, it's critical to have the discussion about how our policy has contributed to this problem, and therefore how we have an obligation to help solve it. I, I hear you talking about force, but let's talk unstable governments and politics and how you separate the military. I mean, our history is that, and my question is, is Iraq currently have a stable government? Do we see any stabilization of the Iraqi government for the foreseeable future? ISIS took over because the army over there abandoned all these fantastic weapons and we spent 10 years of billions of dollars, how do you separate the commingling of unstable governments with military force? Uh, as I, I said, and I think it's absolutely critical, force is only a part of the response. So that you use the force that you need to try to protect the civilian population in the immediate circumstance. But you're absolutely right, a big part of the solution in the Iraqi context has to be a political solution, and a big piece of that is overcoming sectarianism in the new Iraqi government. Uh, I know that there is some optimism about some of the new uh, nominations, but some great pessimism uh, about some of them, the interior minister in particular, who is said to have ties to uh, very nasty Shiite militia groups that helped to create 
alleviate some of the anger among Sunnis in Iraq uh, that helped to sort of foster this problem. But I think one of the key things we need to do is to stop talking solely in sectarian terms. I heard a lot of Iraqis uh, complaining about that, that they saw the U.S. in particular as pushing a very sectarian agenda, which was, in the words of Yanar Mohammed, the agenda that they really need to defeat uh, to be able to move forward in Iraq. Um, my question is, from an American perspective, it's very difficult to get accurate information on what is really going on in the Middle East. Do you think Al Jazeera is a good source, or would you recommend some other source of uh, the best accurate information we can possibly get on what is going on currently in the Middle East? Uh, a lot of people in the U.S. seem to like Al Jazeera as an alternative news source, but I would tell you, for me, sometimes it really looks like the Fox News of Arabia. Uh, <laughs> Now, it depends. Al Jazeera Arabic and Al Jazeera English are a bit different, but many people in the Middle East and North Africa, especially women's rights defenders, will tell you that their view of Al Jazeera, especially Al Jazeera Arabic, is that it is a Qatari financed station that has promoted fundamentalism and been soft on fundamentalism in many instances. Um, and so I would encourage you to look for alternative independent news sources. A source that I love, that I write for a lot, and that tries to really publish voices from the region, including in translation, is a wonderful website called Open Democracy. And you can find there you know, voices from Tunisia, voices from Syria, voices from uh, Iraq. And I think it is so critical that we find ways to listen to people who are not necessarily communicating in English and make their material available. Uh, you can also do what I did, although it's getting more dangerous, and that is actually go to the region and talk to people. I interviewed 300 people uh, it, from nearly 30 countries. And I think you're absolutely right. We can't always believe you know, what we're necessarily hearing in the headlines. Uh, you have to work a bit hard yourself to get out there and find more of the truth. Uh, hello, my name is Valerie B. Brown, and I was wondering about, um, uh, I, I think it's very important that we should be engaged with what goes on in the Middle East, and I'm a, I'm a writer as well, and um, we're having problems in America too, and I was wondering uh, what could, a person do uh, to get engaged with what goes on with what you and I'm sorry I, didn't I was wondering that. what can a person do to uh, get informed and I noticed you was talking about that it's important for a person to that have insight to be a part of a movement that can make a difference and I was wondering what can I do to get engaged with what goes on, because I'm a prophetic writer, and I'm in a struggle in America. And when you talk about the slums over there in the Middle East and the young woman neck being slashed and and the terrorist group getting is involved, well, in America is uh, we it's important for us in America to be a part. It, uh, a, a part of a movement that not only affects us abroad, but also domestically. And I was wondering what can we do to get engaged? I, I think it's absolutely true that there are very serious human rights problems here that need to be taken care of. But I think we also have to care about what happens on the other side of the world. I, I believe in universal human rights. I believe in solidarity. And every one of these stories that I heard wherever I went, whether it was my father's home country or another, uh, really became a part of me. And I, I hope that we will both, you know, think lo locally and, and think globally and act locally, but also think globally and act locally. Locally. It seems to me that both of those pieces are very important. Uh, one of the things that we can do in terms of people getting involved is bring some of the people like those in my book to the U.S. to talk, to be heard uh, for themselves, uh, to share these stories. Uh, and you can do that in a range of ways. Uh, you can do that with the book. You can go to the website for the book, which is karimabenoon.com, and there's an excerpt uh, there that you can share. Uh, Salon.com very kindly ran an excerpt of some of the artists' stories, and you can and share those uh, as well. I think it's so critical. One of the things that we can do is to help these people be heard here. Can you talk about 
the Egyptian military establishment and their smashing of democracy in the form of the Muslim Brotherhood? And how are we supposed to choose between like, which is better in terms of human rights in that struggle? Because both seem to be lacking in human rights. Thanks. Well, the first thing I have to say today when asked a question about Egypt is really to express solidarity with the people of Egypt after the horrible killings yesterday of 33 Egyptian soldiers in the Sinai Peninsula. And it's amazing if you think about the amount of press coverage that was given justifiably to the Canadian soldier who was killed in Ottawa on Tuesday, but we've hardly heard anything about this mass killing of Egyptian soldiers, it appears, by a jihadist group in the Sinai Peninsula yesterday. One in a litany of uh, big killings of uh, law enforcement and military personnel there. Now, the situation in Egypt is, of course, very complicated, and I don't think we have too much time for me to go into it. There is no question that the military-backed government is also committing abuses, uh, but I think I likewise understand why a mass movement of Egyptians uh, last summer, not this past summer, but the summer before, uh, r strongly felt that they did not want the Muslim Brotherhood in power when they saw the way that the Muslim Brotherhood was trying to uh, install a theocratic constitution in their country that would set it back for years, uh, when they saw the way in which the Muslim Brotherhood uh, was further cracking down on the press, uh, was imposing more and more restrictive dress on women, uh, and so on. So I can really understand that popular uh, anger against the Muslim Brotherhood that ultimately led to its ouster by the military. Now, the Egyptian activist that I talked to, uh, one in particular that I think of, a, a women's rights activist named Doa Abdelal, was so determined to still find another alternative, which is neither the military nor the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, and I think that is the key challenge before Egyptians and before people across North Africa today. Uh, and what, one of the things that Doha stressed to me is one thing that can really help is in the West if we actually understand that there are multiple sources of threats to human rights in a country like hers. Uh, now there is mainly discussion in the West about the military's repression. And it's good to discuss that. You know, women's rights activists have been put in jail. Journalists have been put in jail. All of that is wrong, whether it's happening in the name of fighting the brotherhood or not. But we also have to talk about the large-scale terrorism that is being carried out uh, by jihadist movements. Some allege, at least, that some of these are happening, at least with some collusion of the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, but that is not clear. And that challenge remains for Egyptians uh, to find a, a sort of a really positive outcome for their revolution, which was not a revolution designed to install a theocratic dictatorship or to bring back the military. It was about building something better. And in my book, I call these the imaginary and poetic republics of North Africa, borrowing a phrase from an Algerian writer called Mustafa Ben Fodil. And I still believe those republics are out there somewhere. Thank you for your informative talk. I was wondering how you balance condemning Muslim in, um, fundamentalism and not being seen as part of the Islamophobia that is taking... I'm, so, I'm sorry. I, I was wondering how you balance condemning fundamentalism with not being seen as part of the Islamophobia that is um, taking hold of much of the media here in the U.S. And what do you mean by the term fatwa? Uh, I don't use the term Islamophobia because I think it mixes things. It mixes criticism of Islam and I believe that criticism of any religion is acceptable depending on how you do it perhaps. But it mixes that with discrimination against real or purported adherence of a particular faith, which is entirely unacceptable. So the term that I talk about is discrimination uh, against Muslims or people assumed to be uh, Muslim. And obviously that is a very real concern. We have seen the rise of the far right uh, in the West that has a particular anti-Muslim, anti-immigrant agenda. That is not my agenda, and I am at pains to say that in my book. I believe that both the right and the left at times in the West have gotten this wrong, and on the far right increasingly here, we are hearing this sort of suggestion that all Muslims are somehow some big sleeper cell uh, waiting to be sparked into action, and that's just offensive. 
But I absolutely believe that people of Muslim heritage have the right and indeed the responsibility to speak out against fundamentalist movements. And I take very seriously the plea from Asma Jahangir, a very brave Pakistani human rights lawyer, who asked us in the diaspora, please, to speak up in support of people like her in Pakistan, working for peace, working against terrorism. And I asked her the problem about discrimination, and she said, I firmly believe that if you speak openly and clearly about this problem, thereby distinguishing it as a political phenomenon which does not reflect the views of most Muslims, there will actually be less discrimination, not more. And that is what I am trying with many other people to do. Thank you so much for joining us. I, I want to remind people that our author, who's been so gracious to be here, is going to be in the book signing tent immediately following uh, this presentation. And again, thank you all so very much.